I don't know that I would say that the military is what the Honor Harrington novels are about, because I don't think it is. I think what the Honor Harrington novels are about is responsibility, the collision of uh, competing ideologies, the flow of history. Uh, gosh, this all sounds very sweeping. And uh, in many cases of people who do have to make that choice between two evils. If you're a, a Thomas Theisman or a Shannon Fork or, a, or an Alfredo Yu, and you're trapped in something like the People's Republic of Haven, what do you do? It's your country, your loyalty is to it, you know the system is corrupt, you do the best that you can do, okay? And you do your best to keep faith with yourself, even though your choices are limited, all right? That, to me, is more of what the books are about than about yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, military discipline, and so forth. All the gee whiz weapons and whatnot, which are cool and all the rest of it, to me is secondary to the fact that the books are about people doing the best they can in a complicated world. Um, and they take damage and they lose people they care about. They do things they regret doing. They do things which any living human being should be proud of having accomplished. But they're all people. And the military is the template on which they interact. See, I, I have found, for me, that military science fiction works very well to establish the sort of template I need for my decision makers to function. It provides a form of conflict, obviously, if there's an external enemy, okay, but it also provides lots of room for internal conflict. And it also means that the people making those decisions, making those choices, are making them frequently with very immediate, very concrete, and potentially very painful consequences. When Honor Harrington decides to take a heavy cruiser straight into a battle cruiser's broadside and expects her ship to be destroyed and everyone on it to be killed, but hopes that she'll be able to inflict enough damage on the ship to save a planet from nuclear bombardment, Okay, that is a highly moral decision. It's a very stark decision. Most people say, gee, that's the right decision and I wish I'd have the guts to make it. Okay, she has to live on her way in with the knowledge that she's taking this entire crew with her to die because it's her job to do that and it's their job to follow her. Okay, these are kinds of decisions that you can't make that clear cut that uh, um, that clearly understandable and observable in a civilian context under most circumstances. And it's certainly one that you can't do, I think, as a, in an ongoing way in a series about civilians, okay? simply because of the nature of the decisions and the threats and the conflicts that they face. And so for me, military science fiction, in addition to being something, the military history being something that I've studied for so long, military science fiction offers the best machine shop to put together the, the sorts of, of decisions and, and consequences that I need to examine in what I'm writing. Earlier you spoke of the lack of time for reading. How familiar are you with blogging and the mill blogs? I am familiar with the concept. The amount of time that I've actually had to spend time running around them, you know, like that. Uh, I have, interestingly enough, I've been directed to several blogs uh, by people. Um, some of them by, by friends of mine who are in the military who are doing them. They said, you got to go see this site, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it may be like, you got to go watch this. I mean, you know, here you have, I mean, boy, that striker got blown up seven times before I finally went to the junkyard, you know, kind of thing. Um, 
some of it is, you know, you got to see the spectacular YouTube tape. I have found that the time that I have had to spend actually reading rather than just looking at the, at the video uh, has been some of the most rewarding time that I've spent online. And I also have to say that I think that if people who are considering uh, political positions for or against, for example, what's happening in Iraq right now, if they're going to be honestly seeking to make the best decision that they can, then they ought to hit the military blogs. They ought to talk to them. They ought to let, let them, the blogs talk to them. Um, because those are the guys on the ground, you know, or in the air above, whatever. Uh, they're the men and the women who have actually been there, been part of it, seen the mistakes, seen the things that went right, watched the evolution of the situation, and in my opinion, undoubtedly have the best feel for what will happen in the event of, say, a U.S. decision to withdraw. Now, you may not agree with them, but, and, they, and they will, they're not all going to agree with each other, because they don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, there are some very, very dedicated professional guys who I know in the Navy, for example, who have always planned to go career and are still planning to go career and who are deeply opposed to our involvement in Iraq. Uh, I would say that they are probably in the minority among the people who I know in the military and who have been there. And they have their reasons. And some of the reasons are very good and just like the reasons for some of us who want to still be there, some of the reasons are very bad. Um, and some of them are looking at, my God, look what it's costing us and, you know, investment that we ought to be going into new hardware and whatnot. And instead, we're spending it on all these, all these strikers and the Marine Corps acquiring all these armored vehicles that it doesn't fit its mission in the first place. And when we're going to, we're not buying the equipment they do need for the Marine Corps mission, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, some of these issues are more bean counter than, than, uh, than, than based on, you know, some strong moral outrage or support for the situation. But I think that agree or disagree whether they support the war or oppose the war, like I say, like my friend Richard, okay, they're the ones who have paid cash for their knowledge and who I think ought to be heard uh, before any binding policy decisions are made. And when you think about the strain that some of these guys are under with you know, multiple deployments, you know, and, and, and the reservists who, uh, you know, we, the plan from the time that we started downsizing, to you remember the peace dividend? Okay, well, ever since we got ready to collect the peace dividend, it's been obvious to everyone that the reserves were going to be a much more active component of our military status and, and stance. Um, and I think that most of the folks who are in the reserves by now were aware of that before they joined or re-upped in the reserves. Uh, but having said all of that, it's still an immense strain on somebody who is basically a civilian to be yanked out of civilian life, <coughs> sent over there for a long-term deployment, or even a short-term deployment, and then sent home again possibly only to be recalled and sent out yet again because he has or she has a particularly necessary skill set. Okay, that's really hard. It's hard on the families. It's hard on the families of the regular military, the guys who volunteered knowing that they were going to have the skill sets that were needed over there and that they were going to get sent, but who before the, before, uh, the invasion of Iraq never anticipated that they might be someday soon seeing their fourth deployment as a unit to Iraq. Um, that's hard. That's real hard. And yet a lot of them that I've talked to have said, you know what, of course we don't want to be here. We're not insane, but somebody has to be here. And it would be a huge mistake to walk away. 
<coughs> because it would throw away everything that we've managed to accomplish after the mistakes, and it would it would uh, foreclose uh, anything we might yet accomplish. Now, I've talked to other people who said, you know, I've been over there three times, and you know, the uh, entire to, to paraphrase Frederick the Great, you know, the entire kingdom isn't worth the bones of a single Prussian grenadier. Uh, you know, we're, we're just killing people. It's ultimately an unstable situation. They should get us out of there as soon as possible. If it's all going to go crunch, let it go crunch and get it over with. Okay. That's sort of the extremes of the two positions. But the majority view at least among the people that I've talked to have been over there, is the, you know, we're here and we need to be here right now. Um, and that, I think, is some of that uh, uh, responsibility taking that I was talking about earlier.